So now we'll shift our program to movement from Brianna and now Maria Waldy Douglas, um, who will join us now. She has been practicing physical therapy uh, for 29 years and is employed at the Struthers Parkinson Center. She's been a part of that team for the past 25 years. She received certification in LSVT Big Therapy for Parkinson's. Uh, the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery Training, Nordic Walking Instructor Training, Rock Steady Boxing Program for Parkinson's, and is certified as a yoga instructor and leads a weekly yoga class for persons with Parkinson's. And in 2018, she completed her 200 hour registration or register as a yoga teacher cert certificate. And I think she probably could eat dessert today. <laughs> you probably, because they put dessert on the tables. So that was. You're welcome to. Okay. All right. Anyway, so help, help me welcome Maria. Nope. So when I was asked to speak here today, I told Aaron McGee from the Parkinson Foundation that I was not going to subject my audience to death by PowerPoint, especially after lunch, because I tend to see people nodding off quite a bit in a warm room. Now you're going to be eating like a mountain of dessert. So I have to keep your attention however I can so we can bring the lights up even in the room. Since I won't have slides, um, there's a continuation of the handout packet that you have. So after Dr. Nance's talk, all, everything that I'll be addressing is on this handout. So by no means should you feel like you have to take any notes. But I just want you to have that. And I might go through some of the more science-based material a little bit more quickly because I'm really all about practical application of science. And that's just my nature as a physical therapist. We're concerned with people's function and people's quality of life. So that's what I'm really going to be focusing on. And so Dr. Nance kind of set the stage for everybody by talking about all of these non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And again, on my handout, we have that analogy of the iceberg. You see the tip of the iceberg above the water, but then you see quite a bit bigger mass below the water. And that's kind of how a lot of these non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease are. And sometimes those are every bit as distressing or disabling as the actual motor symptoms are. So Dr. Nance talked a lot about the cognitive changes that can occur, and that's one non-motor symptom. And I'm going to be talking about some other non-motor symptoms, namely depression, anxiety, and Dr. Nance also touched on this, apathy. So if you get nothing else out of the science part of our talks today, the important thing I want you to know is that Parkinson's affects your brain chemistry the chemicals in your brain. You know that certain chemicals are depleted, and there are also other chemicals that are just out of balance. So we've heard of dopamine, of course, that's the major neurotransmitter or brain chemical that's implicated in Parkinson's, but there's also other brain chemicals such as acetylcholine, serotonin, and norepinephrine that are also affected. And don't worry, there won't be a quiz on these names or how to pronounce them. But we know that there's many medications that are taken in a result to balance these chemicals or try to replace some of the chemicals in your brain that are depleted. Okay, so that, that's going, that brain chemistry is going to also have an impact on your mood. So um, just having a... a mood that is low or a depressed mood is not just a consequence of having a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. In some cases, yes, that's a circumstantial event that might affect your mood. But we know in studies that many times people have symptoms of mood, be it anxiety or depression, far before their Parkinson's is ever even diagnosed. So there's something going on with those brain chemicals that's causing that to happen. And the same is true for anxiety. So there's a lot of statistics that you hear out there about these mood disorders 
and Parkinson's. So between 4 and 40%, which is kind of a wide range, of people with Parkinson's disease experience anxiety. Okay, more commonly, it occurs in women, those that are more um, diagnosed younger, young onset before the age of 55, and people that already have a diagnosis of depression. And so there's many different types of anxiety and anxiety disorders. For some people, they might have just a generalized anxiety disorder. For others, they might actually have anxiety attacks or panic attacks. And you may have experienced them yourself or, or felt them yourself. And interestingly, a lot of times, folks with Parkinson's may have that anxiety they experience more when their medication is wearing off. So when, when they're kind of wearing off, they might have those symptoms of anxiety. And maybe that's something you have never thought about before, or maybe it's something that's a reality for you every day. Um, OCD, or obsessive compulsive disorder, is another sort of subset of anxiety brought on by performing certain rituals or acts, whether it's you know, having to check the clock or wash the hands you know, many times, those sorts of things. And those may never have occurred in that individual prior to having the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Um, so it, it may not have been a lifelong problem up until that point. Depression as well is very common in Parkinson's disease. And one statistic thrown out there is about a third of individuals with Parkinson's disease also have a diagnosis of depression. And another statistic is that you're twice as, as uh, likely to have depression if you do have Parkinson's. So again, it's the brain chemistry. It's the chemicals in the brain that are causing some of these mood symptoms that people might be experiencing. And so um, when people with PD have the depression treated through medication, it's also shown that their Parkinson's disease improves as well, and those symptoms improve. So it's very hard to distinguish sometimes what's due to Parkinson's, what's due to depression, because many of those symptoms seem the same. You know, reduced interest in things that used to be pleasurable, feelings of sadness, weight loss, or sometimes weight gain, difficulty sleeping, fatigue, slow movements, slow thoughts. Does any of that sound familiar? <laughs> you know, so those can be symptoms of Parkinson's, but they can also be symptoms of clinical depression. So to be considered what would be a major depressive disorder, five of these nine symptoms that I mentioned would be present for at least two weeks or longer. And that's why it's good, you know, to be seeing some, a doctor that specializes in Parkinson's disease, a neurologist such as Dr. Nance, that really understands both of these things together because it's important to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's disease adequately, but it's also important to acknowledge that these other mood disorders exist and need, may need to be treated as well. And then there's that A word that Dr. Matt, Nance mentioned called apathy. Um, and in about half of PD patients, it's been found about 50% have some degree of apathy. So if you just want a very simple definition of what apathy is, it's kind of that just lack of motivation, just a general loss of interest in things. And it may be also associated with depression, or it may just exist on its own in people without depression. But it, that starts to affect the family system in which the person with Parkinson's might be living, whether it's the spouse, whether it's the adult children. You know, come on, you always used to like to go out to the football games. You know, how come you're sitting here? How come you're not going to the Y? Or, you know, we, we want to go on a family picnic. We want you to come. And, um, you know, so that can be a very distressing symptom that definitely needs to be, dis you know, addressed. So for some people, 
These may be the very first symptoms, even before the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, like tremor or slowness or stiffness appear. So it's almost what they call a pre-motor kind of a symptom. And you know, for those of you that may have had Parkinson's for a while, you're familiar with those sort of ups and downs that you might have based on when you've taken your medication or how much sleep you got, those motor fluctuations that sometimes you might have more of a tremor or you might be really slow or having trouble walking and other times it feels like you might not even have Parkinson's disease. So, you know, some people kind of ride that roller coaster a little bit, not all, but there can be these fluctuations in function. Well, the same thing can happen with mood in Parkinson's too. So sometimes the mood may fluctuate. It's not as though an individual may always have anxiety or always have symptoms of depression, but those things may wax and wane as well. So it suggests for some people that those low dopamine levels can contribute to these problems. So just like you have wearing off and you have motor symptoms, you might also have mood symptoms as well. And I think it's just important just to know that, you know, taking some of the stigma of mental illness away, that this is just like if you're diabetic, right? Your blood glucose is off. So you have to do certain things to help to balance your blood glucose, same as if you have these mood symptoms because of the imbalance of brain chemicals. It's not a personal failing or, you know, something that should be stigmatized, but it just, it's just something that goes along with the brain chemistry. And, of course, there are medications that are used and prescribed quite effectively in these mood disorders. However, that's not my topic today because I'm a physical therapist, so I'm here to really talk about how exercise has a positive inf you know, influence on mood, okay? So when they've studied this in people, they've, it isn't like an either or thing. So it's not as though you just have to take medication or you just have to exercise. It's, you know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It's usually best treated when both go hand in hand. Because if you think about it, to really optimize how well you're able to exercise, you might need a certain amount of Parkinson medication on board to be able to perform that exercise effectively. If you have slowness and stiffness and you can't do the exercise very well, it makes sense that if your medication for Parkinson's is optimized by your doctor, you're going to be able to participate in that exercise and, and perform better with it. So it's, it's, and also there are safety issues with exercise as well. If you've got some balance issues or some weakness, you might be a little bit more likely to lose your balance or to fall. And of course, we want to make sure that all the steps are followed so that doesn't happen because we want the exercise to be effective. So there have been studies, many studies done about how exercise improves motor function with Parkinson's, how people can improve their balance, their walking speed, their day-to-day -day function of getting up from a chair or turning in bed. So that's pretty well established. That's a pretty large body of evidence. And there is a newer body of evidence that's emerging about the positive effects on exercise just on a person's mood in the face of anxiety or depression or apathy, but there haven't been as many big clinical trials yet. So what I'm telling you is smaller sample size and there's, there's more work to be done. These non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease are being more and more looked upon where, you know, because I've had the <laughs> good fortune of being in, in the, this career for quite a long time, almost 30 years, that wasn't the case initially. I don't think people were talking about exercise and cognition or exercise and mood. You know, they were looking at purely the motor benefits of exercise. But now there have been some studies, and there have been some outcomes. And so there's been studies. One study was a six-month strengthening program, three days a week. 
and showed people had an improved positive mood, and they measure it through you know, various inventories and tests to, um, to test what a person's level of mood or depression is. Early start or late start, um, a cardiovascular exercise program, they looked at the people that started early showed the biggest improvement in mood rather than waiting to start exercise later. And um, there's another study that just looked at aerobic exercise for 12 weeks, you know, where you're moving your body and getting your heart rate up. That also showed benefits for mood. But um, there was also a study that looked at community-based exercise. So just coming to classes, not necessarily working one-on-one -on -one with a therapist, but just coming to class. And it showed that over a year's time, people had increased social interaction and improved moods. So there's some good evidence that's starting to show up that exercise can help with some of these things. And the good thing about it is it's a non pill way to manage it. Now, there may be medication that's needed, and that's a conversation to have with the doctor. But then there's some non-pill ways to do it as well through specific exercise. And it looks like so far the studies coming out have looked at both strengthening and more cardiovascular aerobic or um, community group exercise programs. I'm also going to talk about some breathing techniques because my background in yoga has sort of led me down that path and to show how even breathing can help with things like anxiety and depression. So, you know, I think that, you know, the, the major summary of what I'm saying is that depression, anxiety, apathy are all fairly common feature of people with Parkinson's disease. They kind of, because the brain chemistry kind of go hand in hand. And it, it's caused by neurochemical changes in the brain, you know, the, the chemistry of the brain being off. So improving the mood through maybe, you know, therapy, meeting with the therapist, counseling, medications, and exercise may, may help people to overall holistically manage that with quality of life. And so I think um, those are all important things to be thinking about. So there's even more ammunition now as to why exercise is an important tool. Not only is it going to help the body and the movement, but it may help the cognition and the mood as well. So those are a lot of good evidence that exercise can help your brain chemistry and help the pathways develop in the brain. It's not just like making the muscle stronger, making the heart stronger but it's actually having an impact on your brain. So that's you know, the overall message that I want to get across. Now, we need more studies to take a look at this because they've been done on a small scale, and many of the folks in the studies haven't had severe mood symptoms, and there's been some other things. But it looks so far that resistance exercise and aerobic exercise for sure are winners when it comes to mood. But as many of you know, and even the people of us that don't have Parkinson's know, it's not always so easy to get yourself to exercise, is it? You know, we live in Minnesota. We look out outside. You know, there's this snow on the ground. You know, before we had that bitter cold, and we had the ice, and, you know, I was taking my little puppy on a walk, and I wiped out like three times on a walk. You know, I thought, geez, I don't want to go out there again. You know, there's many barriers that, that are, are keeping us from being as active as we would like. And even if you lived in Florida, you probably have different barriers. I was just in Florida. You could say, well, there's gators and, you know, there's humidity and, you know, who knows. But, you know, so there's always barriers to exercise. And so, you know, when they actually have studied people with Parkinson's, they came up with three different um, kind of top barriers that people had to exercise. And the first one is lack of time. So people are, you know, even retired people. I mean, you're busy people, right? Sometimes people tell me they're more busy now when they're retired than they were when they were working. Uh, so there may be a lack of time or a perceived lack of time. Fear of falling was a top barrier too. I don't feel too steady as it is. I certainly don't want to 
fall down when I'm trying to work on exercise. And the third was just that it's hard to get started, that lack of initiation or apathy. You know, how many people can relate to you know you should do it and you have to have this little conversation with yourself to get yourself to do it, to, to psych yourself up? Come on, be honest. How many people have had that sort of little, you know, internal conversation? Oh, you know, you really should go. Well, you know, but, you know, I got to do some laundry and, you know, I don't know. And so, you know, there's always that struggle, that internal conversation that can go on. And there's always, who can't come up with a good, we got some darn good reasons why we, we don't exercise as much as we should, right? And people with Parkinson's should have even a better excuse because it's harder to do it in the first place, you know, but... I think um, I work, one of my colleagues uses this analogy a, a lot, and I kind of stole it from her. She talks about snacking on exercise throughout the day. Rather than having a huge meal of exercise all at one time, to chunk it out in intervals throughout the day. There's been studies that have shown doing 10 minutes of exercise three times a day is as effective as doing 30 minutes of exercise all at once. So let's say you have limited time. Let's say you have limited energy. Who doesn't have 10 minutes, okay? 10 minutes is not that much. And even if you did it a few times during the day, you know, make it as painless and as easy as possible. So that's one suggestion. As far as the safety suggestion, you know, being afraid of falling, it's important that you get into a class that's paired with your abilities. How many people have had that experience of going to a class that's maybe just a little bit above your level and being like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? So, you know, I do yoga. I am a yoga instructor, but I am by no means the most flexible person in the world, nor the strongest person in the world. And I've been to yoga classes where people are doing handstands or headstands and doing all kinds of crazy stuff I don't think my body is capable of doing. Well, luckily, the PT in me is like, okay, I'm not doing that because I'm going to hurt myself. You know, I'm, so you have to make sure that you are in a class where you, if you're going to a class where you feel comfortable or if you're at a gym or you're exercising at home, you're doing something that you're capable to do, and there are some safety precautions if you, there's going to be a risk of falling or injury. So, for example, in yoga, we have props that we use. So, guess what? I can't just stick my leg out and grab my foot so easily, okay? My hamstrings are not that long, and my arms are not that long either. But there's this wonderful thing called a strap. <laughs> that we can use, and I can stick my foot out and lasso my foot, and I can do some amazing things with that strap that I couldn't do without it. And there's even things like today when you were doing some of the exercises to have a chair next to you. And in many classes for older adults, whether it's silver sneakers, whether it's, um, you know, any, in many classes that we have available at Struthers or senior fitness classes, there usually is a solid support surface that's available for people. Just even if you don't have to touch it, you know it's there. Or maybe you just have a finger or two on it, and that gives you that perception and that reality. Okay, there's something solid here I can contact. So having some props there, making sure things are geared towards your capability and your fitness level. Just because, you know, you played basketball in college, doesn't mean, you know, three decades later you're going to go and slam dunk the basketball. I, I'll never forget, and I never was much of an athlete, but I did play volleyball in high school. And when you're, you know, five foot nothing, you know, you're not that great up at the net, believe me. But I remember years later we were going to play a game, and it was the adults versus the kids. And I thought I'd just throw the ball up and serve it over the net, and it was like, oh, <laughs> you know. And then our hands, our arms, everything were just sore and bruised because we weren't used to doing that, you know. So, so, so it's, you're never going to hurt yourself by starting out on the easy side. You can always progress it, but you might regret it if you do something too fast, too quickly, and then you have an injury that keeps you on the sidelines. Um, and I think one really effective strategy I know for myself over the years 
is to have an accountability partner, have an exercise buddy that you, you could exercise with, be it your spouse, an adult child, your neighbor, maybe somebody that's maybe even a little worse off than you isn't a bad idea, you know, because then you feel like it's mutual, like you're helping them, they're helping you. You know, however it works, it's, you know, it's somebody to be accountable to. You're going to show up, you know, on the doorstep and go for that walk, or you're going to meet each other at the Y and you're going to go to that class. Or I even had, when I had little kids and I couldn't get out of the house, my husband was at work, like I had a, a friend that would come over and we would do exercise videos in the family room together. You know, I never would have done that on my own, but because I had somebody that was coming over, I had to roll out of bed and put some exercise clothes on and, and do my thing. So thinking about that, some people do really well in a group setting. There's a lot of studies that show that people that attend exercise classes are more compliant or stick with it just because you have to show up at a certain time to do it. And then it's just part of your routine, part of your day. You know, maybe at the beginning of the week, you figure out what days you have conflicts, what times you have available, and it's just like scheduling a dentist appointment or a doctor's appointment. And you, but you try to make it happen more often than going to the dentist because once every six months to exercise just isn't going to cut it, okay? But you know there's maintenance you have to do to take care of your teeth, right? You're supposed to floss. I don't know how many of us actually do that every day, and we're supposed to brush our teeth, right, two or three times a day to keep our teeth. So, you know, using that sort of dentist analogy isn't a bad analogy when you think about doing exercise for preventative maintenance of the body. I think I'm a person that responds really well to music. How many people feel more energetic when they listen to music, to upbeat music? Right. I mean, it just, you know, in most of the exercise classes that I've ever taught, I use music. Even in yoga, we might use more calming music, but we use music. It sets a mood, and there, are, there is research to support that, that music has a rhythm, and if you exercise to that rhythm or if you walk to that rhythm, it actually helps you to move better, especially if you have Parkinson's disease. The music and the rhythm helps to drive your body to move in sync. And even if people say, well, I've never had any rhythm, it doesn't matter. If you can walk, you have rhythm. If you've ever been able to walk, you have rhythm, because guess what? Walking is a rhythmic activity, okay? So if you listen to music that has rhythm, it's going to help you to walk better. Um, you know, some of you, I have some of my exercise posse out here that I see, that have, I, I know have attended some of the classes I've taught, and I, I won't call you out, okay? But there is one class that I teach every week called Movement Boosters, and we always, they love to do the marching songs. We always do a marching cadence song. And even people that freeze up and have difficulty walking are able to do that because that marching music, it doesn't have to be just marching music, but it helps them and helps them to feel more energetic. So music can be a motivator. And even just believing that exercise is going to improve your quality of life. It's called self efficacy, believing that something actually is going to happen, that it is going to be true. So, you know, for example, you could use the negative example, like, you know, people know that smoking can cause lung cancer, right? There's probably not a lot of debate about that, right? You, you know that. And, and you know, you, you might know, too, a fact like moving more and eating less helps you to lose weight. Okay, that's, that's, you know, nobody's, not too many people are going to argue about that. But, you know, there's a lot of convincing evidence and scientific backing for the fact that exercise can help you to move better, improve your thinking, and improve your mood. You know, so just even coming here today and attending an educational event that is telling you that and telling you stuff that's based on science, based on research, not just stuff that we're making up, but this is actual stuff that's been studied in a very scientific manner. And so knowledge is power. So you want to take that knowledge and internalize it and think about exercise is like medicine. If you're somebody with Parkinson's disease or any other health condition, hypertension, you know, diabetes, you know that exercise is going to help you, hopefully, to feel better with minimal side effects. And so you're going to take that medication, right? 
going to probably take it as it's prescribed. You know, you're not going to be like, meh, I take a, you know, I take levodopa like, I don't know, once a week, you know, whenever I feel like it. No, you're probably going to take it the way it was prescribed because it has a short half-life and because the doctor has explained those things to you and because hopefully you've begun to experience the benefits of it. And I'm just using that as one, one example. But that's the same with exercise, that if it's done consistently, regularly, just like medication, it's going to have that same positive impact on your quality of life. So I think just kind of taking some of these things that you've heard today and then trying to, and some of you are probably already on the exercise bandwagon, so good for you. And some of you maybe have fallen off the wagon and gotten back on a few times, and some of you maybe the wagon's way in the distance and you're kind of sitting on the couch. You know, there's a, we've all been there at different points. But um, so I just wanted to do, because of course I can't have people sitting still for too long, it's just against my nature, um, I am going to do a little exercise with you. And that's so simple, I think, that you're going to be able to do it. There's two things we're going to do today that I think pretty much everyone can do. And you can do it sitting if, if, as well as standing, just depending on what your energy level is like and how you're feeling. So we're going to do some kind of walking in place or sitting and walking in place. And we're going to do breathing. I'm pretty sure everybody in this room is breathing right now. Am I right? I hope so. OK, and I'm pretty sure that a majority of people had to walk in here to get here. Or if you use some kind of a device to get in here, you're able to operate that device. So there's some movement that's available to you. So I'm going to ask you to use the movement that's available to you. We're going to put on some music, and we're going to work on some of that brain chemistry that we've been talking at you about, OK? So I'm going to get my little uh, sound system here. And I'm going to ask you to give yourself some room. Now, if you want to have a chair in front of you so you've got a little something extra to hang on to or to the side of you, feel free to do that. If you'd prefer to do the whole thing sitting in your chair, heck, you're still moving. You can do it sitting in your chair just as easily, OK? So either way, I just picked some songs that I thought were kind of fun that had to do with walking today. So either sit up tall in your chair, stand behind your chair, or stand clear of your chair, depending on how steady you're feeling right now. OK, and we're going to start with a few little warm-up movements. And then we're going to progress to actually doing a little bit of walking in place. This is so simple. Anyone could do this at home, OK? There, this is not rocket science, just because I'm a physical therapist. OK, so we're just going to start plant your feet wide, either in the chair or standing. And then I'm going to have you reach up with your shoulders and lower down. Up and down. Now do a backward circle. Roll that shoulder. We're just loosening up the upper body because we've been sitting for a while. One more time. And then we're going to shift our weight side to side, just warming up the lower body a little bit. OK? So the title of the song is The Walk of Life. OK? So we're going to do The Walk of Life. OK? So we're just going to do a little bit of walking in place, maybe just letting those arms swing a little bit. Or if you're sitting, just do some little marches. Good, just let those arms swing. We're going to change it up a little bit. Maybe you're lifting those feet a little higher. Maybe you're swinging those arms a little bit more. Okay, now we're going to change the movement to a side step. So you just need a little bit of space. Step together. Step together. You can hang on to a chair and do it, or you can just move your feet in the chair. It's like a junior high dance, okay? <laughs> Good. And if you want, you can move your hands one way and then the other. Okay, this is easy stuff. 
It's just moving our body. Side to side. Okay, now we're gonna change it up again. So hold still in the center. Maybe you wanna hold some support and lift one knee and then the other. So we're doing a little bit of a high knee march. And if your balance is a little better, you can swing the opposite arm. High knee march. You can do this in the chair too. And just respect your own limits. Okay, two more. All right, the next movement now is gonna be with the upper body. So just little mini marches with the feet so your feet are moving and we're gonna do some rows now. Put your hands out, squeeze, press, squeeze, press, pr squeeze, press, squeeze, press. Squeeze, press, squeeze, press. One more. And back to swinging those arms, marching in place. Can you believe this has been four minutes? This song is a four minute song. So you've almost done this for four minutes. My goal is we're gonna be doing some kind of movement for 10 minutes, okay? Just so you can see one of those exercise snacks that I was talking about. So we're snacking on our exercise, people. All right. Now, we're gonna pick it up a little bit, okay? Okay, swing those arms. Still marching a little bit, swinging those arms. Really pump the arms. We're walking on sunshine. Maybe you're starting to breathe a little bit faster. Maybe your heart rate's coming up. Maybe you're even getting a little warm and you're regretting wearing a scarf, for instance. <laughs> okay, now here we go. Hands come to the shoulders. One hand up, down. Up, down. Up, down. Up. Now both arms, up. Down, up, down. Now there comes a point in this song where she says I'm walking on sunshine and everybody's gonna have to yell, woo-hoo! Okay, get ready. Okay, just ready. Woo! -hoo! One more. Okay, good. It's, okay, now we're gonna do a heel in front. Heel in front. Heel in front, heel, heel. And think about when you're walking, the heel hits first, doesn't it? Otherwise you tend to shuffle. So we want that heel to strike first and if you're really coordinated, your opposite hand will come forward. But don't worry, nobody's watching you. <laughs> nobody's judging you or grading you, just keep moving. That, your brain doesn't care. Your brain just likes the movement. And heel, heel. Okay, now we're gonna go back to the high knees. Lift, lift, woo! We, at least we have sunshine today, right? Woo! Lift those knees. Oh, she's, okay, we have a request for the twist. Okay, I didn't make this up. Twist, twist, twist. Bring the opposite hand to the hip. Twist, twist. We don't have any chubby checker today, but that could be arranged. Twist, twist, twist. I love it. And back to a regular walk in place. 
All right, keep going. So this is almost eight minutes. We have about two more minutes. We're gonna have one more song and we're gonna do a few exercises that involve building strength by using our body weight. So we're doing a little bit of aerobic first, this stuff, and then we're gonna do a little bit of strength. Okay, so let your movements die down a little bit. Now for these next strength exercises, you might wanna grab the back of a chair. You can also do them seated. All right. So grab the back of that chair or sit up tall in your chair. Who feels good, huh? Okay, so hang on and we're gonna lift the heels up, going to the balls of our feet and down. Heels up. We're strengthening the calf muscle because we're lifting our body up. Now, if you want to get fancy, you can lift one arm up. We're going to do about 20 of these, although it's hard for me to count and move at the same time. <laughs> lift. Lift. Let's do five more. Four. Three. Two, one. All right, the next exercise is for our upper body and our posture. So you want your feet apart. You want to stand up tall, hands come to your thighs, maybe a little bend in the knees, and then we're going to press back, squeeze your shoulders. Come forward. Press. And forward. Press back. Forward, press, 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 five to go, press, press. Now you can have a second helping of dessert. Two more, press, and hold. Last exercise is a mini squat. Hands come to the hips or you can hold a chair. Just a small bend of the knee. Keep your back nice and straight and straighten up. Little squat, straighten. Little squat, straighten. You can hang on to your kitchen counter and do these in the kitchen. Straighten, bend, straighten, bend, straighten, bend. One more. And reach up. And give yourself a round of applause. Excellent. Go ahead and have a seat. So 10 minutes, people, that's what 10 minutes of exercise is like. Now, that wasn't so bad, was it? Not too terrible, but at the same time, it was a little bit. You felt like you did something. Any comments from having done that? Maybe how you feel more differently now versus how you felt at the beginning? Felt more energy? Okay, good. That's a good thing. How about mood? Does anybody feel maybe a little looser or feel a little bit happier from having done that? Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, the last thing I just want to spend just a couple minutes talking about, um, and, and we're, I know we're getting ready to wrap it up here, is just that, you know, so there are these very active practices that can help us to improve our mood. But there's also things involved with our deep and mindful breathing that can help us, especially with symptoms like anxiety or panic attacks. And um, that, that using the breathing and participating in mind and body exercises, such as an adapted yoga class or things of that nature, can be very helpful to help to calm our nervous system down if it's in overdrive and kind of short circuit that 
fight or flight response. So I just, you know, ask that you be open to those sorts of practices and know that they exist. Um, and those are all sort of um, non-medication ways of helping your body to deal with some of these mood difficulties, but also that you should always consult your doctor and talk about medications or other treatments. And I think it's when all the players on the team, you're the quarterback of the team, so to speak. If you're the individual with, with Parkinson's, you know, you're the person that, that gets to call the shots and call the plays ultimately. But I think it's not all just about the pill piece or about the exercise piece or whatever, but it's everything working together. So I think the more people that you have on your team, the more effective you're going to be at managing the mood in, in Parkinson's. So that's all I have for you today. Did Any we, questions for Maria? No. Hold on, hold on. Okay, try that again. Do you have a couple breathing techniques? I definitely do. <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the best ways to really be mindful about breathing is to just, you know, find a, a nice supported chair where you're sitting upright or lying down flat. And then just putting your hands along the belly, first below the rib cage, and just pay attention to feeling your hands expand and contract and just be mindful of the breathing. And then doing the same with your hands up on the chest, you know, feeling that expansion. And then, even though you can't put your hands on your back so easily, feel yourself expanding outward through the back side of your torso. So you're thinking about when you're breathing, you're activating movement in the entire torso not just in the chest and in the shoulders and breathing rap rapid or shallow, but you're engaging the whole torso in breathing. And then experiment with just breathing through the nose and perhaps just counting how long you inhale and how long you exhale. And then as you just find that natural rhythm of your breath, you can even try to extend the exhalation a few extra counts. That's been shown to stimulate the vagus nerve in the body, which is kind of the quieting, calming. It's a cranial nerve. It comes from your brain. And um, it goes to your adrenal glands, to your heart, to your lungs, and helps to slow down the respirations or the breathing, slow down the heart rate to calm the nervous system down. Um, you know, there's, there's great apps. There's one called Calm for your smartphone that will lead you through many breathing exercises and just short meditation. So there's, there's a lot of resources out there um, to help with just very simple breathing exercises that can be effective. Any other questions? Oh, Erin, she's running that? around with the Michael or Angela. Would you do just a brief uh, summary of the exercise classes at Struthers? Sure. You know, we have classes that are for different levels of, of Parkinson's. And, you know, so I talked about the importance of getting classes that are right for your level of function. So we have classes that have low, medium, and high intensity. So the classes that are considered more of a low intensity might be for people that might have difficulty standing or maintaining their balance. So there are some seated exercise groups. Um, and then the moderate intensity exercises, there's a class called Movement Boosters that's based on the LSBT big principles, but it doesn't have to be specifically people that have completed the 16 sessions of therapy. Anyone is welcome to join the class. And the focus is on big movements. Half the class is done in chairs, and half is done in standing behind a chair for support. We have two different levels of yoga classes, one that's more adapted and um, where you're using a chair for balance poses and things, and people do get on the floor. And one is a little bit more advanced yoga class where people aren't using quite as many props. 
We have a power class, the Parkinson Wellness Recovery. That's the highest intensity exercise class that we offer. The entire class is done without you know, use of supports. Some of the stuff is done on, for floor exercise and then energetic standing exercises. Somebody back there, I think it's Beth, I can't tell. <laughs> I was just curious when you became a convert to exercise. Is it, you know, when back when in, you were doing PT, was it already something that you were um, You know, on? I was somebody that was never a jock. I was never athletic. I was never really in sports. I mentioned volleyball. I played volleyball, but I wasn't very good at it. But I found just fitness, like outdoor activity, was something that I love, um, whether it's you know canoeing in the Boundary Waters, hiking on the Superior Hiking Trail, riding my bike, you know. So I think that's been a part of my life from early on. Cross country skiing, and just feels good. I mean, if you're gonna live in Minnesota, you kind of have to embrace some outdoor activities. <laughs> Even in the way I was snowshoeing with my husband last night with our headlamps on and <laughs> going through it because it's like, well, you know, we might as well enjoy this snow if we have it. So. You know, and I've just seen it make such a difference in my profession and people's quality of life. You know, that just reinforces it. 